you can even watch back Giving players all the props or put them on blast We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line Can hold it down. Shout out to my man Sammy, got it off the ground. And to all the listeners tuned in right now, got debates, analysis, and speculation. This is sports talk for the new generation. You know where to find us, got a reputation. Sick podcast, your number one sports destination. We're giving all our devotion, riding high on this wave of emotion. Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time. No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line. All in, we came in to win. We're gonna give everything. S-I-C-K on the run. S-I-C-K, sing, sing. On fire, we're ready to fight. We'll bring the house down tonight. S-I-C-K on the run. S-I-C-K, sing, sing. S-I-C-K, it's the sickest. For the audio, or you can even watch back, giving players all the props, or put them on blast. We don't give no hot takes, only talk back. S I C K, S I C K, S I C K, S I C K, For the audio, or you can even watch back, giving players all the props, or put them on blast. We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts. We're giving all our devotion, riding high on this wave of emotion, going all out, yeah, cause this is our time. No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line. Can hold it down. Shout out to my man Sammy, got it off the ground. And to all the listeners tuned in right now, got debates, analysis, and speculation. This is sports talk for the new generation. You know where to find us, got a reputation. Sick podcast, your number one sports destination. We're giving all our devotion, riding high on this wave of emotion. Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time. No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line. All in, we came in to win. We're gonna give everything. S-I-C-K on the run. S-I-C-K, sick, sick. On fire, we're ready to fight. We'll bring the house down tonight. S-I-C-K on the run. S-I-C-K, sick, sick. S-I-C-K is the sickest. For the audio, or you can even watch back, giving players all the props, or put them on blast. We don't give no hot takes, only talk back. S I C K, S I C K, S I C K, Turn up your volume, because you're about to listen to the Sick Podcast. With Tony Marinero. 55 seconds left in the penalty, a minute and 27 seconds left in regulation time. Boston 4, Montreal 3. Lafleur 
coming out rather gingerly on the right side. He gives it into the mayor back to the smush. The sickest Montreal Canadiens podcast. <laughs> there is a ball. Sports entertainment like no other. Rejoint, on lui fait perdre la rondelle une passe devant. Et c'est la bonne chose. Et c'est la bonne chose. Ce sera la victoire des Canadiens. Tout salué pour les Canadiens. Le fac troisième de l'histoire. You found the dogs. John, you found the dogs. He found the dogs. And all together, they worked the young team to the top. And now, a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadians win the Stanley Cup. Brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La Vida TV. Embrace your true nature. And Playground, your premier gaming destination. It's going to be sick. Marinero, the sick podcast on this Thursday, October 12th. It is 10.02 p.m. and we are here and we are ready. The sick podcast brought to you in part by Energy Transportation Group, a leading full a leading full service logistics provider serving all of North America, driven to be different. Also brought to you in part by Playground, over 600 machines, poker tournaments, Playground casino games, daily promotions, unmatched customer service. Why go anywhere else located just over the Mercier Bridge, only minutes from downtown Montreal Playground and brewed in Quebec, a winner of a dozen international awards. La Bita TB, these guys right over here offer quality microbrewery beers made with premium ingredients for everyone's taste. La Bita TB, embrace your true nature. All right, okay, so uh, we're going to get to that and we're going to get to George Larac right away. I'm sure he's pumped because George. Uh, yesterday told me on BPM, hold on a second, let's put that right here. Okay. George told me on BPM yesterday, uh, sports radio, that Arbor Jack guy would fight Ryan Reeves. I agreed with him and he said, he'll take Ryan Reeves. And I said, no, he won't. Well, it wasn't the fight of the century, but in my opinion, it was a win for several reasons. We'll talk about it with big George. George, what's going on? Tony, what's going on? Uh, I just uh, my son just finished playing the hockey game, and I'm and I'm in Edmonton right now in my truck. So uh, yeah, I'm waiting for him any uh, minute to come in the truck. So I won't be driving, but that's why I'm in Edmonton right now. He's playing. What do you want me to do, Tony? No, no, I, know, I, I, I understand, hey, but I mean, I think, I told I think, me my son's playing. Tony, I, no, he finished. I watched the whole game. I just okay. he's done. So I'm in my car. So I watched all of it. He's yeah. just getting undressed. But Tony, you did the show when you were in Portugal. You did the show when you were in Miami. So I'm doing the show from Edmonton. Uh, no problem. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, now okay, here's so, the deal. Yesterday okay. on the radio, you told me that Jack I would win his fight. I didn't think he would because Ryan Reeves, big guy, tough guy, National Hockey League, until last night, he's considered the number one in the league. And brand new team, signed the contract as a free agent, goes over, playing the home opener in front of his fans. I didn't think Jack Guy was going to beat Reeves in a fight, but I knew he was going to challenge him, and he did. Now. Okay, so, 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 okay. So, there's a lot of things I want to say about this, because obviously there's the Toronto fans saying that it wasn't a fight, and then there's some people that are like, oh, well, he didn't beat him up, and some people want to defend it. So, just so people understand the sequence, Ryan Reeves is in Toronto to give some rules to the Stars player. The shift that he's having, he's playing physical to show why he's there. He hit Gouley partially from behind. Jackai came in to defend them. So when Jackai came in to defend them, perfect balance, perfect stance. He attacked him right away. He was aggressive. He got Reeves off balance. Reeves was ready in the beginning, but he was not ready with the strength and the way Jack I approached him. So Jack, like Jack I didn't beat up Reeves, but he made him look bad in Toronto in front of his fans. Correct. The first game, the first game that he plays in front of his fan, like Reeves looked bad. When Reeves ran down with the netting and everything, it was bad. He's the heavyweight in the league. He got schooled. Even though he didn't get beat up, he didn't go back in front of his fan. So when I saw this fight, I was like, okay, the way Reese what after the fight, he was pissed because he's like, you know what? This does not happen in my building. He did this to me. I'm going again. I thought Reese was going again. If I was Reese, the heavyweight in the league, and I get embarrassed at, my, at home, I'm going again round two. So 
I even look at Jack. Especially when since the next time you're going to play is March 9th. Yeah, but forget March 9th. You're in your building. You want to show everyone. I was out of balance. It was luck of the draw. I'm going again. So I thought it was going to be around two. I saw Jack High in a penalty bench when he came back uh, to purge a couple more minutes of penalty he had because he had an instigator because the NHL are more severe about it. Even when I look at his face in the penalty bench, he saw it was coming. He was focusing because it's like, you know, Reeves probably going to come for round two. Reeves never did. He never came for round two. There's a time he could have went on his side. He almost iced the puck. There was a little contact center ice. He saw Jack High. He didn't want round, round two. Why? I don't know why. But he knows that now he has someone that could mix it up with him. Maybe, I don't know if he didn't want to look bad in the second round. I don't know what it was. But Jack High now is commanding respect. Because it doesn't matter how you want to clarify the way that it went, he did unreal. And that is going to go around the league. It went around the league when he beat up Cassian. Now he's going to go around the league how he handled Reeves. So now, guys in the Montreal Canadiens, they'll have more respect. We know they're not going to make the playoff. That's okay. But at least there's a presence that is there that is reassuring to their star players because he did his job amazingly. And again, the Jack High's job is not to be a heavyweight. It's not to beat up everybody in the league. He did his job yesterday. He's a hockey player. And you know what? Hopefully what just happened there, he won't have to do it as much because he sent a message to the league and the pressure was not on him yesterday. But it how about this, Reeves. George? How about this? How about this goes around the league, everyone sees it, and everyone thinks he's the new sheriff in town. Aren't they going to want to challenge him even more? Because now, if they beat Jack Guy, they get the belt. Yeah, but who's going to who's gonna be stupid enough to do so? Luchik? Who's going to be stupid enough to... No, but obviously, Luchik is in Boston. He's going to be a candidate for sure because he's going to play physical. So I'm pretty sure they'll mix it up probably at least once this year. But what I'm saying is that there's not many guys in the league in, in that caliber. You know, if you, Reeves, Luchik, Jack High, McDermott, um, DeLaurier, um, you know, who else? They are in that maybe in Edmonton. They are not just big, but it's not really. ibama has gone. They are not just big, but it's not really in that, you know, that caliber yet. So there's no one really in the league that are in the caliber of Jack High, Reeves, and company, right? Yeah, of but course. at least, at least the respect and what he's done was tremendous. George, you know, I think we're on the same page here on this one. Uh, credit to you. You knew that he was going to do well. I'm going to tell you something. I saw it when I want, they had plenty of opportunities. For me, the biggest win is that Reeves did not go for the revenge, did not go for the yeah. rematch. That's and true. you know what? That's you true. said only he knows why. But for me, Jack I looked like he was willing to give it to him. Jack I looked like, okay, you know what? I know you want your rematch. I know you want your revenge. Let's go. It looked like he was ready to drop the gloves. I get the feeling that Reeves underestimated Jack Eye's brute strength. He felt his power, and he probably didn't think he had that power. I don't know if that's true or not. Hey, I just got off. I was on um, La Poche Bleu, the La, La Taverne hockey segment just now, and jean Charles and I had a little bit of a spat like we usually do, and I told him that, in my opinion, Jack Eye was giving the rematch. Jean Charles says, I don't know what I'm talking about because Jack I got 17 minutes in the box. And if he was going to go again, Marty St. Louis wouldn't have had it. And he, there's no way he was going to go. One's more valuable than the other. I think it, Marty St. Louis no. said today, Marty St. Louis said today, I never did that job in the National Hockey League. I don't know what it's like. I know that Jack I was ready for it. If it was going to happen, there was an opportunity. I am not going to punish him for getting those minutes because he Are you did kidding he me? Go that hey, hey, first of all, they if somebody say that, they don't know what they're talking about, Tony. They have no idea. They don't understand this job. Jack I got us together because he defended Gouley. He stepped in. If he defended a, a teammate, that's awesome. Madison, all the guys were like, wow. They def he defended his teammate against the toughest guy in the league. You need balls to do that. He did it. And he did it well. So there's nothing no, wrong no, Hold on it. a second. How and, about and, it? And, do, you and, think, and, do you think Marty St. Louis would have been okay if yeah, on round two, Tony, without defending Tony, a teammate, you just go, both of you. Tony, if somebody goes after Jack High and Jack High oblige and he goes, Martin St. Louis is not going to say anything against it. Are you kidding me? It's the code. It's Toronto, Montreal. He's not going to chicken out in front of his teammates. He wants to show everyone that he's tough. Like, and he could do it. And, you know, his confidence is building up. He, he, he was 
even you know what jack i was probably nervous before the game and it's normal like everyone would be knowing that this could happen right after this fight that he had with him his confidence is skyrocket because i'm telling you for a rematch it'd be way more confident for a rematch than he was for the first fight that he had with him that is the big difference tony because because of that hold on hold on Marcus yeah, no, go, go. yeah yeah Marcus, no, no problem. come say hi come say hi come here Hey, come on, Silva Mocha. How you doing, buddy? We're live. Uh, Marquez is Tony Marnero. We're doing, we're, doing, we're doing the sick podcast. How Marquez you doing, champ? Sick tonight. High five. He said, how you doing? Yeah, well, we might have five. He can't hear you. Okay? Yeah, you I, tell, tell him I heard he had yeah. a sick game. Yeah, sick game like the sick podcast because it's going to hey. be sick. I'm, I'm not going to I'm not gonna keep you much longer because I'm not going to take away from the quality <laughs> time with your son. But I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this. Yeah. Um, you've been on this podcast as a regular for quite some time going back to last year. Last yeah. year, on more than one occasion, you said, I'd love to have the opportunity to work with Arbor Jack Guy because there's a lot of things he doesn't know when it comes to fighting. There were images of you with Michael Pizzetta on the ice and Broussard going back a couple of months. Somebody happened to be in the arena. They took the pictures. At that point, you couldn't deny you're on the ice with Michael Pizzetta. You came clean and you said, I gave Michael Pozzetta some lessons on how to defend himself, take care of himself, and how to drop the gloves. He's better looking than you. All right. Yes. Then, I'm talking about your son. Then, all of a sudden, you started going on radio, on television, on podcasts, everywhere, and you started saying, Jack Guy's going to fight Ryan Rees this year, and he's going to beat him. So, I know you. I've known you for 15 years, and earlier today, finally, 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 you admitted it to me. You wanted to end it, that you helped Arbor Jackai. Now that you open the door, I'm going to walk right through. I have um, an idea of how this all went down. You started working with Pizzetta. You told Pizzetta you can help Jackai, or he told Jackai that you can help him, and you started working with Jackai. How did it go down? Just tell me, once and for all. What did you do? Tony, okay, you know what? Yes, I did help him, okay? And, okay. and th that's all there is to it. I, I helped him. That guy is very strong. He's on the amazing. ice, by phone, on, on ice. Zoom, on the, on the ice. On the ice, on the ice. He's very strong. He's amazing. Big hand, strong as hell. He would give me a hell of a fight. He, he's really? amazing. Really? Yeah. Yeah. He's, no, Tony, Tony, he's pretty strong. It's, it's just a couple technical stuff. His hands and stuff like this. He's amazing. I love that guy. I love Jack. He's my favorite so, player on the team. So break down and, what and, happened and, yesterday. And, 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 what, and Tony, what happened is that the, the reason why people, I think, caught up to it is before I met him and I was talking last year about his technique and, and I was ranking the toughest guy in the league and I was saying everyone that Reeves was the best and he was the toughest. I think I put so much emphasis about the fact that he was going to beat him that people caught up to it because they're like, well, all of a sudden you said Reeves is number one and now you're saying Jack Kai is number one. So obviously, you know me. You So... I can't lie every day like this. So, okay, that's fine. I did. I have. And I was nervous, too. And I'm proud of him. And he's amazing. And he doesn't need me. How many he's times were you on the ice with him? How many times were you on the ice with him? It's not important. He's strong enough. He doesn't need me. It's okay. a couple of technical stuff. He's amazing. He's the toughest guy in the league. No one's going to touch him. Forget it. Jack Eyes, the new sheriff in town. The All new right. sheriff in the NHL. Hold on a second. Stay away, stay away from him. Hold on a second. Did you tell him to surprise him the way he did? Because he's dropped the gloves right away. He didn't give Reeves a chance Tony, to react. Did you tell him to do that? There's many different there's many different scenarios that you could show someone when you get into fights and stuff. So I'm not going to get too much into the technical, but there's scenarios, there's rushing scenario, there's defensive scenario. Tony, it's fighting is an art. I know people are looking at it on the ice and they think it's easy and, and it's all you just hit and this and that. There's many things to do. There's many ways that you can take advantage of an opponent when he's out of balance, when he's in power, when you're in disadvantage, when you're close into someone, when you have the reach, when you have the power. There's so many things to do that that question you're asking me, it, it will take hours to answer. At least I give you what you wanted. You got it. Okay. okay. Everybody's happy. You yes. can start asking me the question. Hold you on. Can now. Start asking me the question. Let's focus on the game now. I will. I will let's focus cheer on the, the game. Canadians. Yes. Let's cheer the new sheriff and George. George, you're on fire, George. Look, look, George, you're on fire. Look, look. Fuego, <laughs> 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 my friend. <laughs> hey, listen. Hey, just hold give on me a something. Give me something in, in Italian. 
E mo se tu, mo George, io ti parlo la patata e tu mi rispondi fagiola. Ma vatti a fare la passeggiata, George, ma fai la mash. Hey, listen to me carefully. Hold on a second. When you felt Jack Ice brute strength on the ice, yeah. as soon as you felt it, are you like, okay, this is something you're going to use to your advantage because you're going to use that brute strength to get him off balance. Like the way the fight went down yesterday, is that the way you kind of, in an ideal scenario, had it planned? But Tony, it depends again what the guy is giving you. Like the guy has to, like Jack I is smart. Yeah. And you got to feel, if a guy is in a vulnerable position, you got to take advantage of it. When you're fighting a warrior, there's no, you don't wait for a guy to, to, to get his stance back to normal. You know, he caught him off balance. You left them off balance. You don't let him go back up because if you do, you're going to get killed. And that's the way it was. And he did it beautifully. His stance, he had power in his leg. It was perfect the way he did. As soon as he got Reeve off, like, off balance, he made sure he was never going to get back to balance. And that was perfect. That was textbook. Okay. He made him look bad. He put him down in his home. And that's why Reeves had nothing to do with him. After. Perfect. Explain this to me now. The second that you know, he, he jumps them, they tangle, they both get in a couple of shots. And then all of a sudden, they, they, they separate and then they, they reset. The second they reset, he jumps them again. But it kind of looked like he almost jumped in the air to get him. What was what, he what, doing what, there exactly? And what, when you watched it, what what did you think he was going for? What did you think was going to happen? He was getting he was getting mouth balance again. He was he getting was mouth smart. balance again. He knew he knew with his strength that he could control him because Reeve doesn't have his strength. Reeve is strong, but he doesn't have the technique. Fighting is all technique, Tony. It's like strength is important, but if you don't have the right technique, doesn't matter how tough you are, you can get cut up. And he did cut. He did got cut up. And one thing I could guarantee you, Tony, I will never help Jack. Uh, I will never help Reeves ever. Why? You guys are buddies. Ever. You met it. You met with the NHL. He's and my friend. He's yeah. my friend. Reeves is my friend. But I will never help him. Hey, has he? I help Jack I, He's the he new shirt. He's my boy. Jack is my boy. He's my man. I'm his biggest fan. And because of that, I cannot help anyone now anymore. That's the him and the Montreal comedian, Pezzetta and him are the only guys that I'm going to help. That's it. Has uh has look. Has Reeves contacted you at all by text message since the fight? No, but I know when I'm going to see him, he's going to be laughing, but I'm not going to tell him anything because those are tricks, those are techniques, those are things, and uh, it's not going to come from me, that's for sure. Uh, do you know what's going to happen now? I, I don't care what's going to happen. No, Ma I'm not going to help anyone. Max that's Domi is Max Domi, Max Domi, Max going to end up helping Ryan Reeves at Toronto. He could try, but you know what? Tony, I was one of the best to do it. And you know what? I have some technique that no one knows. And only two guys know and they're in Montreal right now. <laughs> <laughs> You're the best, you know. That. Where are you going now? You're happy you now? Yeah. You're happy now? Yes, yes, I'm here. happy. Listen to me. Hi, Marcus. Hey, hey Marcus, <laughs> listen to me. You can't you can't lie to me. The second you started saying he was gonna take him happened after you were seen giving fighting lessons to Pizzetta. So I know, I knew right then. Pizzetta put you guys in touch, and you got Jack Eye on the ice, and you gave him lessons. I knew. Yeah, but I'm just another was, pretty face. I'm like a lawyer, was, me. Do it together was so, anyway. What was so important to know that anyway? Why? What was so important to talk about it? I don't need the publicity. Tony. This is breaking news, my friend. It's breaking it's news. It's breaking news. That's what Marinaro. <laughs> nobody in the city, nobody in the province had this. In and listen, has so anyone? You know, why is it so important? Because it's inside information. Has anyone had a type of discussion like this with you outside? No, only you. no, no, only, only you. me. That's it. A step ahead of everyone else. I'm the other side of the street. You were knowing every single day. You were, you hey were guys, telling me this every single day. I'm over here. <laughs> Tony, you were annoying with that subject. Every day, you wouldn't let that go. But now we got the answer. I wanted to know if you ordered the code red, and you did. Did you order the code red? Did you order the code red? Yeah, God damn right, I did. <laughs> okay, thanks, Tony. All right, where are you going with your son now? Uh, he's, he's hungry now. He's going to go probably eat a cow. Okay, so listen. Uh, which I he's not vegan. He's not vegan. It, not, not yet, eh? No, not yet. And I let him pick. I don't think it's something you should impose on kids. Uh, I am, but when he's old enough, if he wants to do it, I'll support him. All right. I uh, I got okay. bad news. What? I broke my fast with fruits. Oh, it's okay, Tony. I did two days. So you did two days? 48 hours. 
Okay, so we'll do we'll we'll start another day. We'll do another time. All right, okay. I want it to be honest. Okay. I did it on the yeah on the, actually. Okay. All right, okay. Listen, awesome. why don't you go okay, and, go. and, and okay, you, out. we'll talk to you later. All right, okay. okay there okay. you have it, George Larac. Very much appreciate his time. He's a regular collaborator on Thursdays, but I mean, he's with his son and he's at Edmonton. I mean, that was pretty nice of him. But uh, this is what I did. All right, okay, folks. As you know, I've introduced Mike Johnson of TSN to the Sick Podcast as a collaborator. He joined me a couple of days ago, and he joined me earlier today as well. Because of Mike's schedule, because of Mike's schedule, he's basically doing region. He's doing games for three teams. I believe it's Ottawa, Toronto, and Montreal. If I'm not mistaken, he's very, very busy. He works most nights, and the only way that we can pull this off is that I actually pre-record with him earlier in the day. So without further ado, earlier this afternoon, I touch base with former Montreal Canadian, Mike Johnson. Watch here. I am doing, listen, I'm better than the goaltenders around the league after night one. That was, or not night two, I yeah. guess, but yeah, first games. Um, I'm good. I'm good. It's fun to be back up and running. And I guess the Americans had their opening night on, on the first night. And then Canada's opening night last night was, was fun. I have a theory. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's it's just a theory that I have. And my theory is that it takes a while for teams to have their defensive system play as best defensive hockey as they can. And now some of the preseasons are a little bit shorter and there's a lot of experimenting. And I just think that more goals are scored in the first month of the season. And then once the defenses start to settle in and settle down and they start, you know, learning the defensive systems, then scoring will go down a little bit. I don't know if it's true or not. I don't know if the stats say that, but if I was a betting man, I'll tell you this in the first month of the season, I would take the overs a lot more often than I would take the unders. You're not wrong. I think anecdotally uh, that feels right. I think statistically that is also mostly right uh and i listen, i was working last night with Corey schneider really good longtime nhl goaltender and he kept saying i hate i hated october hockey for that exact reason because the offense is ahead of the defense and you just haven't quite dialed in your defensive systems you haven't quite gotten the same page your attention to detail is there but it's it, the intention is there but it's not quite there you're probably still not in full game shape so there might be some fatigue setting in so yeah, across the league, like lots of chances, breakdowns, you know, goals and goals for, I guess goals against if you give them up. Yeah, I think that's that's the case early on for sure. You know, it's funny you say that because I had a I had an interesting conversation earlier this morning uh, with a friend of mine who coached at a pretty high level, all right? So he's been a long, long time hockey coach. He was so upset with Marty St. Louis and that game last night because for him, having two two-goal leads, mm -hmm or two goal leads twice in that hockey game and and the fact that canadians couldn't close out that game so they're up two nothing then it goes to three two for toronto then the canadians come back they go up five three and they're up five three with what was it uh, six seven minutes left in the game or whatever it was and then toronto gets back they tie up the game with about a minute to go with an empty net and then they end up winning it in the shootout and he was so upset because he said to me this team doesn't know how to play defense and i said well they know how to play offense and he said, well, it's not because of the coach they know how to play offense because that's all read and reacts. It's because of the talent you have. You let the players, you know, be, uh, you know, at their most creative. You make them decide what they want to do. But defense is something you can definitely teach. They mm -hmm. should have taught it. And I said, uh, I'm trying to play devil's advocate here. And I said, yeah, but you know what? Maybe one step at a time. Maybe they're trying to get all their offensive concepts in. They're, they're most likely not going to be a playoff team anyway, so mm -hmm. it'll take a while. But once they get all their offensive concepts in, then maybe at that point the coach will introduce the defensive aspect of the game or maybe even surround himself with a better defensive technician on his staff. Boy, oh boy, was he upset with what I had to tell him because for mm -hmm. him, it's unacceptable. So the premise of what he's saying is correct. It is easier to get players to be proficient at defense than it is at scoring goals on offense. Like you can take a guy who can skate and a guy who can think and turn him into a pretty decent defensive player. Not great, but good enough. Good enough that you won't blow two goal leads. Good enough that you can kill off six on fives with greater regularity than, say, the Canadians did last night. That part is true. I'm not going to diminish Marty's role in increasing offense and creativity of his players. Like there's confidence, there is situational 
his philosophies, he calls them, about how they want to play offensively. And I saw Kirby Doc right now looks like a man, like he looks like a very good player, better than he ever looked in Chicago. That's mostly on Kirby Doc, but that's not unrelated to him playing for Marty St. Louis and the Montreal Canadiens. So I don't think that they're ignoring the defense just to focus on the offense. I do think, though, the offense, I, if you want to focus on the positives, I know they got outshot quite a bit and they didn't have a ton of the run of play, but some of that is them being up as well. Like you take, you get a lead, you sit back, Toronto's pushing all the rest. But I, I think the fact that they were able to score goals, to be able to finish the way they did to create five past Samsonov, that's a really good thing for Montreal. Like that is a step forward. Now, could Marty keep more games close if he said, you know what? We're going to try to win 2 1. Probably. He probably could. Is that long term the best thing for these players and for the franchise? Probably not. I don't know if that's a conscious decision, but um, I, I don't think you want Ken Hitchcock trying to coach this team to 2 1 wins and losses because that's not going to take them eventually no. where they want to go in the end. Correct. And you know what? If that was the way they wanted to win hockey games, Marty wouldn't have been the guy they would have hired in the first place. That's exactly it. That's exactly yeah. it. Horses for courses, right? Like, and the, and yep. I would imagine, I know Hank Kent Hughes and him have a relationship, but there would have been a conversation. How do you see this? What's your philosophy? How do you want your teams to play? And if they weren't lined up, you wouldn't hire your friend just because he's your friend. You'd hire a guy who, who suits your vision. They obviously have a matching vision. Mike, I'm going to take it a step further. There's 32 teams in the National Hockey League. Only one team wins the Stanley Cup. It's obviously a very difficult trophy to win, probably the most difficult in all the sports. I want to be entertained. I don't want to watch 2-1 hockey games. And with the price of tickets nowadays, like those fans in Toronto last night, I can imagine they're probably paying about 500 bucks a ticket to go to that sure. game last night. At the very least, Connor Bedard's coming to Montreal on Saturday. You want to know at cost, this coming from the team, what the best ticket in the house is going for? $1,000 per ticket. At $1,000 per ticket, I don't want to see them put a shutdown line on Connor Bedard, and if they take a 2 nothing or 2-1 lead, try and close the game and win it. Mm -hmm. I want to see a game that's going to be 5-4 that'll go either way. And if the home team wins, even better. And if they don't, it's okay. I want to see entertaining hockey. We got it. I'm not going to complain about it. I think Marty St. Louis is one of the greatest things to happen to the Montreal Canadiens franchise mm -hmm. in the last, I don't know, since the last time they won the cup. Well, so I, what's the, what's the expression? You can, you can win ugly, but you can't lose ugly. And even if Montreal tried to play a low scoring game, they would still lose more than they win. And yeah. do you want, do you want to watch a whole bunch of two, nothing losses? No. For a team that's probably not going to make the playoffs. Who's in a rebuild. You're not, you're not, you're, you're giving them to a win. decision to tune out, right? Ex exactly. And, yeah. and even as passionate as Montreal fans are, um, they don't want to see that. So, Again, that, that's part of the philosophy. Vegas, when they came in the league, George McPhee was like, no, we're going to be good. We're not trying to draft a team that defends. We're going to try to draft a team that attacks. We're Vegas. Yeah. We're exciting. Yeah. This is what we do. We entertain while trying to win, and it's worked well for them. And, and I've talked to enough players and been around the team enough. You know, Marty's probably still learning at the NHL level, you know, dealing with the bench and tactics. They all love him. The players love him. His And that's not including guys that, you know, that don't play a lot. I've talked to guys that play all the time. I talked to guys that are bubble guys, been in the minors, and they all still love playing for Marty. That says something about what he's doing right behind the bench. And if he's not going to put that much emphasis on the defensive side of the game, and you're going to play in games that you're going to score goals, you're going to get stats. And when you get stats, you, you get buy money. in. You get you, buy in from yeah. the players because they yeah. know they yeah. get paid. The yeah. players are going to get... look at Buffalo. Like Buffalo last year. Awesome offensively, not good defensively. Had a good season, missed the playoffs by one or two points. But all their guys are getting paid on power again yesterday. Yeah, Rasmus Dalina a couple of days before yeah. him, yeah. Yeah, look at Tage Thompson and all the rest. It's what's going to happen. And and it's terrible to say because we're pros and we get paid. We should always do exactly what the coach wants. But when you get a little individual reward, you're, you're scoring well, you're creating points, you know a contract's coming, it, it, it you do become an easier – student you you're you're more amenable to listen to every single thing the coach is saying because what he's saying so far is, is working it's helping you you brought up kirby doc's name before and this guy. We, we actually <laughs> talked about him last episode and i was saying do you see ryan gets and you said no it gets a lot stronger and i get that and gets was another level and i get that and then you brought up mika zabinajad's name and you said you know what a comparable could be mika zabinajad we discussed it right um 
one of the things I've shared on the podcast before, and this is coming from several members of the staff, several members of the staff believe that Kirby Doc is the player on the team and within the organization that has the highest ceiling. Okay. Now, uh, yesterday he was phenomenal and let's bring up his stats. There's one tweet that I saw today. If we can bring it up. Okay. So it's a uh, courtesy of this gentleman here, a big head hockey, who I don't know who he is, but I like the tweet Kirby doc last night, time on ice, 21 minutes and 22 seconds, two assists in the hockey game, three shots on goal, five shot attempts, mm -hmm. one penalty drawn, one takeaway, zero giveaways, three hits, on the ice for three goals for three zero against in a game that you gave up five in regulation zero against and it says doc breakout season loading <clears throat> you know what i love about this there's a lot of things i love about this one of the things i love about kirby doc playing the way he's been playing since he's been a montreal canadian is i'm not going to lie to you mike i hate the argument that i hear sometimes well, if he was good, why did Chicago trade him? You know, you hear this about a lot of teams, right? Now, Chicago traded him because there's people that stopped believing in him, mm -hmm. and Chicago traded him because they wanted their best chance at Connor Bedard. But mm -hmm. it's not because in an organization, a coach or a GM or a scout or two or three people believe that a player doesn't have it or isn't good in that environment that he can't have it or can't be great or can't develop in another environment. Kirby Doc is proof in the pudding. I mean, every single player, uh, you know, who went on to have a good career that had been traded is, is actually proof that that statement is just, it, it's, it's not accurate. Look, look at the coach of the Montreal Canadians. He's in the hall of fame. He's put on waivers. Like, does that mean he can't play? Or does that mean that Calgary made a mistake with Marty? Never drafted. Never no, drafted. Neither was I. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, like people make mistakes. This is not a perfect science. And I think there, I think it's fair to say that uh, the bloom was off the rose for Kirby in Chicago. Maybe that you know they, they were soured on him or were questioning um, that 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 upside potential. And a whole bunch of it is we want Bedard more than we want anything else. But I, I understand that sentiment. I don't know if he's going to be better than Nick Suzuki. But I understand, like physically, he can do things that Suzuki can't. Like he's a, he's, he's significantly larger, um, you know. He, he's probably a bit stronger, um, you know. He's a good skater. But what made what made last night so impressive to me was that he took two guys that have not created offense in the NHL with any kind of regularity. Now Kirby Doc really hasn't either, but I would trust that he's done it more than the other two. Yeah. And he made them dangerous. He helped make them dangerous. Like having played a whole bunch with all kinds of different centermen. There's some that, you know, they're, they're the same as you and some that you are helping and some that they help you. And he looked like a guy who is going to be able to help his line mates. And if he can do that and become what he looks like he's becoming, like that tweet I mentioned, breakout season forthcoming. Montreal's in so much better of a place if they can go Suzuki Doc, or maybe it becomes Doc Suzuki, whatever, one, two, yeah. one A, one B, whatever you want to call them. If he can make those other players go like it looks like he might be able to, that changes the complexion of the Montreal Canadiens going forward in a major way. So um, yeah, he's he's strong, Tony. Like he is a yeah. big, like you know, you think about the Atlantic division and you think yeah. about the guys down in Florida, the guys in Tampa, the guys in Toronto, what they have in Buffalo. Like you're going to need big physical centermen that can match up against those players for the foreseeable future. And Suzuki does that. He's not big, but he works at it. It's not great defensively, but he, he works at it. Doc has the physical tools to lean on players like that, that he's going to go up against. I could see how his style of play probably has some people skeptical because for some, he may seem nonchalant. But for me, mm -hmm. his style is like, it's kind of like effortless. Like he's just, he's a natural. So I think Tony, and, I, and I, I've got, like, he's not the only one who will suffer of this. And I've talked about it often. There is an element of human psychology that people apply to players when they evaluate them. Mm -hmm. And the body language, which some players exude, it comes off as, ca casual is not the right word, but not, 
deathly intense. You know, you have some guys are skating around and they're moving and they're looking like that guy's trying so hard. I have this conversation with my dad, you know, who watched me play. He's like, I don't like that guy. I'm like, why not? He's like, he doesn't try. I'm like, of course he's trying. In Toronto, it was Jake Gardner. Pretty good defenseman, but he played with an upright posture and a kind of emotionless face. And he moved around the ice like he was just kind of going in third gear. And everyone wants Darcy Tucker, who looks like he's, you know, hell on wheels trying to get around the ice. And Kirby yeah. leans more to his body language, his emotion, the way he moves, look just comfortable. Like he, there's more in there. Ryan Getzlaff, a perfect example until he wanted to punch your face in. He looked like he wasn't trying ever until he got 100 points. Like th there is a human element to that. And I can see why people might see that and say, oh, look, he's not working that hard. He, of course, he's trying as hard as he can. He's just blessed with being smooth. You talked about Kirby Doc made a couple of guys produce last night that aren't really used to producing all that much. Yuri Slavkovsky last year in his rookie season, uh, even though you know he was 18 years old and it was his rookie season, I think people expected a little bit more before he went down with that injury about 39 games into the season. Slavkovsky played his best NHL game yesterday. On a couple of occasions, uh, he retrieved a puck, which was very important. He picked up one behind his own blue line, which ended up leading to a two-on-one for Doc and Newhook, which Slavkovsky actually made his way down the ice, won a foot race, made that two-on-one a three-on-one, got a pass from Doc, and his backhand pass to Newhook Beautiful. led to a goal. And on Newhook's second goal, it's Slavkovsky who strips Max Domi of the puck, and then eventually the puck goes to Doc, who gives it back to Arbor Jackeye, a wrist shot with Slavkowski and Newhook in front of the goalie screening, and Newhook deflects it. Talk to me about Slavkowski's game, because I think it was about 10 days ago. I'm on radio saying, I don't know, guys. Like, I don't, I'm not crazy about this player's IQ. I think he suffers from a, something a lot of big, strong players suffer from when they enter the National Hockey League, is that they got by on their athleticism and their physicality. They never needed to exercise that brain. I was starting to question a little bit the tools. He played a very solid NHL game yesterday. And I don't know, 10 days ago, I questioned the tools. 10 days later, I thought he was one of the best players on the ice. Well, I mean, it tells you that he's still growing, right? Like he's not, he's so far from a finished product. I think you are 100% correct. He's been the biggest, baddest guy on the ice for his entire existence growing up, maybe until he got to the finished pro league where he probably was the biggest just maybe couldn't just do whatever he wanted. And he took, you know, last year we saw him, he took a lot of big hits, got himself in some awkward spots because he wasn't used to having other guys be sort of physically capable of dealing with what he deals with. So then how do you manage to create what you're trying to create? If you can't, and the game is faster too, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you can't bully your way through and just get yeah. to where you want, cause you're bigger and faster because guys are as big and as fast. You, you have to be able to think you have to be able to read. You have to be able to interact with your line, with the teammates, as well as, react to what's happening from the opposition and he's still working on that but again this is coaching marty's marty understands how important it is for him to feel confident and to work on these things and when you see that package of physical tools like that that rush you're talking about on new hooks first backdoor goal when yeah. he was inside his blue line chips at the dock and he's got he's he's i don't know he's 15 feet behind john tavares who's not the fastest player but he blows by him on the stretch and mm -hmm. turns what was a two-on-two -two into a three-on-two and then a two-on-one and then makes a beautiful pass, which we didn't see. We don't see him make a lot of good passes. We know he can shoot it, but he doesn't make a lot of great tight space passes, which I think is what they're going to be working on. You see just a little clip of that. And you're like, that's, that's a nice, that's a nice bit of skills that not everyone possesses. That's why he was first overall. Cause if he can tap into that more often, he'll be effective. And I just think, and the other part of him is he bounced around last year, right? Yeah. Expectations. He was on the first line. He was on the fourth line. He was in the power play. He never played. He was in the NHL. He was in the minors. Like he saw everything. He feels like there's a little bit of Slavkovsky. That is Slavkovsky. Not in the minors, but everything. But yeah. 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 So, yeah. 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 I would but, have set them to the world juniors, by the way, but I mean, I'd love to get your take on that. Yeah. I mean, you could do a lot worse. I just think the perception is always dangerous of sending guys back. I would do it, but I, you worry about guys getting hurt in their feelings, but really, just, eh? I, well, I, I think some guys would be offended. Like somehow it, it would suggest that he's a failure in the NHL. Cause he's got to go to the junior. I would, yeah. I would, I would send him. I wouldn't care. I'm like, it's better for you. The yeah. same way I would send guys to the minors. If it's better for you, it's like, don't worry about it. We want, you know, you'll be better for it in the end. 
But I think the connection he's developing with Kirby Doc, and like you know, we're sort of in this together. We're like we're, we're, we're a duo now. It, it does help when you're young. You can latch on to something and and feel stability in the context of the team. And I think he's starting to get a little bit of that. And that was a good game. Now the next one might not be as good. Yeah, but more of that, more consistent, more moments, and then you know he's on he's on the right path. When Alex Newhook was traded to the Montreal Canadiens, there were some who said, I don't know, do we really need this player on this team at this time? It seems like they have a lot of that kind of player. Maybe they needed to have a bigger player. Did they really need another centerman? You already have down the middle Suzuki. You already have uh, Doc. You already have Monaghan. You already have Dvorak. And, and maybe you move Monaghan at one point, but then you still have three others. But Marty St. Louis, Kent Hughes knows him very well, obviously. But Marty St. Louis talked about the IQ, the IQ, the IQ. That's the kind of player he wants on his team. Well, one game doesn't make a season, but then, man, that's an encouraging start. Eh? Two games in your uh, Montreal Canadiens debut? I I was one of those guys, Tone. I was like, they, they paid what to get him? Like, I get he was a high pick, and he comes from a good, you know, good resume, but he hasn't done it at the NHL level to warrant that yet on a really good team. Now, he didn't get to play that kind of role, but I wasn't sure. I, I You know, I hadn't seen it. But they knew, and yeah, like, again, confidence, getting off to a good start, justifying the trade, justifying the spot in the lineup, securing the spot in the lineup, thinking now that, like, mindset's a funny thing because Newhook has shown he can get by, he could have a 10-year career in the NHL and be like a third-line checker guy and, you know, he might get you 12 goals and 31 points and and that's good. And there's a comfort mentally in not putting pressure on yourself to score. And you have to flip that. There's a different mindset. Like mm -hmm. the fourth liners don't approach a game the same way a second liner does. As far as like our expectations, the way they demand themselves to create. I, I, I was that way. And I think getting something early helps him transition from, I'm not just a checker. Like I got to score. And when you think I have to score, it helps you. It drives you to create that offense. And I think, um, you know, he's making that transition right before our eyes to, to a guy who thinks he's, he's supposed to, to create offense you know mike when they made that deal one of the things i was thinking about and don't forget this is an organization that had the year before they had made the deal for kirby doc and they went out and they made a trade for mike matheson uh, and so now why am i talking about all these players it seems to me they're trying to do something like colorado did and maybe they're not the only team Colorado drafted, I wish I would have had this in front of me, but I, I didn't think we we're going to talk about this, but that's okay. I'll, I'll try and do my best here. Mm -hmm. But Colorado drafted McKinnon at one. Mm -hmm. They drafted Landis Cog at two. Mm -hmm. They drafted Makar at four. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, they drafted Byram at four. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, they drafted Rantanen at 10. I think you're correct. Then they went out and they acquired Eric Johnson, who's a former one pick overall. They had Kadri, who I believe was a seven. Nachushkin, I think, was a 10 as well. And so there's a lot of first round picks on that team. And the Montreal Canadiens have Caden Gooley, Nick Suzuki, Cole Caulfield, Kirby Doc, Alex Newhook, Mike Matheson. Uh, the list goes on. Mm. Like there's others here. I don't want to, I think you get my point. I don't know if that's somewhat of the strategy. But it almost, and for the most part, most people believe that players who are drafted in the first round are the best players of that particular age group that year. Mm -hmm. And when you, if if they turn out to be for the most part, and you try and stockpile as many of those on the same team, you might have a recipe for success. There's a reason why they've taken the first round. Like, even if it hasn't gone perfect in their first spot. Remember, Val Nachushkin went a whole year without scoring a goal in yeah. Dallas. Like, he didn't yeah. score. And now all of a sudden he's like a pointy game player in Colorado. There's a reason why scouts put you in those lists to be picked where you are because you have something. Now, who knows what happens on the way to becoming that something, but I would always err on like, I would want to have, if I'm going to build a team and acquire players, I want players that are, that, that are smart, that can skate and that have been successful previously. And those often result in first round players. So I, I, you can work with guys like that. So um, if that's part of their plan, then that would make sense. But 
yeah, like, and, and you don't have to be perfect. Like you're not going to hit on every single one of these guys you take. It's not going to become exactly what you hope they will, but yeah, baby steps, baby steps right now for Montreal. And I think last night was the, the offensive stuff was a real positive development to start the season. So last night was the first game of the season, but it hasn't only been one game now, somewhat more of a, maybe a difficult subject uh, to get into, but we'll get into it. You're a big boy. I know you can handle it. It's difficult for anyone to criticize Brendan Gallagher. He's mm -hmm. all heart. He lays it all on the line. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, this guy will will take a bullet for the team. Listen, he's given his body. You can tell he's given his body to the Montreal Canadiens. Exactly right. And that's what I want to get to. A buddy of mine texted me last night. Over the last year, his skating, it's laborious. It's like this league is getting younger. This league is getting faster. Yeah. I know Brendan's only 29, but in a 37 body, it seems. Mm -hmm. What would you do with Brendan Gallagher? And there's not much you can do because he's got several years left on that contract, paying him $6.5 million. With all due respect to him, you know, he's not going to yeah. be attractive to another team. Yeah. But what would you do with him on your hockey team to not offend a veteran player who's a big time leader on the club and wants a big role, but make him buy into what you're going to sell to him so that you can actually get the most out of him? That's a very good question. And there is no easy answer, right? Like, you know, they're, they've, they've thought about this all summer. Okay. Where do we position him? How do we coach him? What do we ask him to do that allows him to be a contributor, but also recognizes the reality of his physical situation? And, you know, Brennan probably can't play top six anymore. He can't play those many minutes. He can't play at that pace with the players. Like the NHL is just, it goes so fast now. Yeah. And like, and, and you're probably not going to put him on the power play, maybe on the second unit, but probably not for those reasons. So, you know, are you going to ask him to check? I guess you could. Is, can he, is he going to play on the fourth line? And, and you're going to need to have these conversations. Like, can you use his experience and his will and his guts to be like an effective fourth line player that plays, you know, eight, nine, 10 minutes a night, you know, you, you protect them situationally. Um, you know, he's not you, a prototypical fourth line. No, of course right? not. He's not an energy player, right? No, he doesn't hit guys. And again, and it's not cause he's not, you know, he doesn't hit guys cause he's not fast enough to get there to hit them. Right. He's kind of chasing the game. It's always around him. And what made him good early was that he was quick, never fast, but quick. He's lost the first step or first two. So we can't dart to those loose pucks. To the open ice to get it like he used to and he just doesn't get around the puck often enough you were hoping that marty was trying to explore different areas on the ice where he could operate to be successful hasn't really clicked just yet it hurts that montreal is a team that doesn't have the puck all the time right because if the montreal was you know whatever carolina the best possession team in the league brandon gallagher looks a lot better because yeah. he's not chasing it he's kind of moving with it but that's not his reality. He's in Montreal. They don't have it all game. So I guess you're going to, if it's me, it, and it's hard conversations, but you probably have to limit his role. You probably have to talk to him about embracing being a leader, being a teacher, being a mentor, maybe not playing every game and giving us what he can when he's there. But understand that, you know, that third line with, with Monaghan and, and Pearson and Gallagher, we talked about their speed, right? We talked about that might yeah. be a, that might be a challenge, even though they're all smart and veterans. And I and I think it will be. I, I think you probably need to interject more pace on that line to make them more competitive. My great stuff again Saturday night. It's the Canadians playing host to Connor Bedard and the Chicago Blackhawks. He's not bad, that kid, huh? Oh my God, two games. I mean, he's got like eleven shots, twenty-two attempts, goal and an assist. And the thing is, to when you watch him, he's probably been unlucky to only have two points. Like he could have four points. He's been, and he did it against Pittsburgh, who are supposed to be good, and Boston, no. who had 135 points last year. He's the real deal. It'd be a pleasure to watch him in person. Interesting stat. He picked up his first goal in the National Hockey League. You probably saw this before Sidney Crosby or Connor McDavid did, who picked it up in their third game of the season. He picked it up in his second. You know, he's been talked about in that category for the longest time. He's a special player. Obviously, the kid's a phenom. The, the greatest thing that can happen to the National Hockey League right now, but MLS is really growing and growing fast in the United States. The NBA has really caught on, of course, with the young generation. They're all basketball fans. The game is exciting. It's a small court. It's offense one way and then offense the other way. 
And, you know, I love Connor McDavid and I, I love the Edmonton orders, but Connor being in a Canadian market, you know, if the National Hockey League would have wanted their way, they would want their stars in a U.S. market. And now they got Connor Bedard in a big time important market in the United States, which is Chicago, which is great. Yeah, that ping, that ping pong ball landed nicely for the NHL. Chicago needed a savior with Kane and Taves leaving. They yeah. got one in Bedard. Hey, say hi to my buddy Melnick later today. Yeah, I will. All right. All right. right. Thanks for doing this, Mike. Appreciate it. All right. Okay. All right. There you have it. We're back. Um, And um, yeah, Mike Johnson, I recorded that with him earlier this afternoon. And uh, of course, he was on with Melnick right after that. My uh, my former colleague, of course, and uh, and my friend. Um, All right. Okay. So for all of you watching right now. Oh, by the way, a shout out to Fantini Coffee. FantiniCanada.com is the website, and um, and I went to see uh, Tony and Adamo and uh, and everyone there. Ca- Cafe Fantini is the coffee, uh, premium roasted espresso. It's the Italian style that makes itself home, that smacks of art, fashion, culture, experiences to be enjoyed and appreciated. You can find it in a lot of big time stores in Montreal. You go into cafe bars establishments. Uh, most of the coffees that you're having is actually Fantini. Personally, uh, the gold is my favorite, uh, and I end up buying the gold, but uh, Fantini coffee uh, in more and more establishments in Montreal, in big box stores as well. It's uh, quite the coffee. Uh, we are, it's uh, it's 10.52. I'm going to take a couple of your text messages, uh, and then we'll say good night. Uh, all right, okay. I'm pretty happy that we got George Larac, by the way, to admit that he gave Arbor Jack Eye some lessons on the ice and taught him different tricks to prepare him for different scenarios. Pretty happy about that. All right, okay. Uh, Agnello, Sammy, Juliana, get that clip ready because it's going to be all over the place uh, on social media. Um, Eric Lavalle says, Scoop. Yes, Eric, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, this guy's getting more sponsors than I can't say that. This coming in from Ryan. Uh, Baker, uh, Ryan, yes, we're getting a lot of partners. You want to know why? Um, because we reach about 3 million homes per month. That's why. Uh, those are pretty amazing numbers. Think about it. Um, radio stations can get you anywhere between 300,000 to probably the most listened to station in Quebec will probably get you about, um, we'll have 2 million people maybe listening, 1.5. Um, most radio stations, 300, 400, 500. We're reaching 3 million homes a month. Uh, that's why you have a lot of people wanting to partner up with us, and uh, we're pretty happy about it. We're pretty excited about it. Carl Dajna says it's time for a spruits. There you go. That one there is for Carl Dajne. Uh, okay. Um, Eduardo says, great addition the Maple Leafs have with the coaching staff and hiring assistant coach Guy Boucher. Uh, yes, I'm happy to see Guy back in the game, but I believe the Toronto Maple Leafs had like the second best power play in the league last year. So I'm not surprised that Toronto scored like four power play goals last night. You know, it's, it's, a, pretty good, it's a pretty good situation when you tell Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, William Nylander, John Tavares, and Morgan Riley, or John Klingberg to jump over the uh, um, the boards and make their way on the ice for a power play. It's a it's a pretty good situation. It says dreams of silver seasons. We are a high end goaltender away from making the playoffs. Maybe you're right. You know what I tell you? I tell you this. I'm happy. Tony Titani, Tony, if you want me to explain it to you, reach is one thing, views are another. Now, if you want to add views per month, add all of the YouTube views, add all of the Facebook views, add all of the Twitter views, add all of the Instagram views, add all of the Twitter videos, add all of the TikTok views, Out all of the audio listens on Google, Apple, Spotify, and you're going to get the numbers that I just told you. And if we want, we can give you a printout. We can also show you how many countries we are 
and where we're ranked. We can also show you where we rank with any other Montreal Canadiens podcast in the world. And the stats say that in the last couple of years, uh, we're ranked pretty good. Thank you very much. That's the way the new modern day of social media works. This is what the numbers, this is how you work the numbers, okay? Now, if you don't know what they are and you just want to throw a comments on YouTube, that's okay. It's up to me to give you the explanation. I just did. I thank you for listening. I thank you for watching. I very much appreciate it. All right, okay. Thanks, everyone. Once again, you are my sick army. You are my sick community. For George Larac, who went on live, and Mike Johnson, who joined me earlier today, thank you so much. Thank you all for your comments. Thank you all for reaching out. We'll be back tomorrow night, same time, same place. Matt O'Han will be in on Friday nights. For Agnello, hey, T, how come Mike Johnson calls you Tone? I don't know, but that's okay. I have no problem with it. If you would have told me when Mike Johnson was playing that I would be working my own Montreal Canadiens podcast one day and he would be a collaborator on my show, I, I would tell you that Mike Johnson could call me whatever he wants. All right? I'm okay with Tone, by the way. I'm okay with Tone. Tone, Tony, Antonio, Anthony, Marinaro, I'm okay. I'm good. I just, you know what? Uh, I want collaborators like that. I want listeners like you. I want viewers like you. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. Once again, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you did, like it, share it with your friends. Comment sick, S-I-C-K, S-I-C-K, S-I-C-K. And if you're going to listen to us on Apple, leave us a five-star review. It's our way of feeling the love. Merci beaucoup. Bonne soirée. Thank you very much. Have a great night. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow The Sick Podcast with Tony Marinero on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La Vida TV. Embrace your true nature. And Playground, your premier gaming destination.